Calling the meeting of the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee to order at 10.30 a.m. because um, a quorum is present. And I am now going to turn, as chair, I'm going to turn the running of the meeting over to our vice chair, Evan Ross, for today. Take it away. All right, thank you. So we have uh, an agenda uh, in the meeting packet. Uh, however, we're going to start with an item uh, that is not on the agenda uh, under items not anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance, uh, which is consideration of this resolution that we received, resolution affirming support for access to safe and legal abortion in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and across the United States. Uh, our purview as governance organization and legislation, of course, is to review it for uh, clarity, consistency, and actionability in its content and organization. And so, of course, we're not discussing any of the content of the resolution, uh, but simply whether it is clear, consistent, uh, and actionable. And so, does anyone have, uh, I'm assuming we've all read the resolution before coming here today, um, does anyone have any comments, questions, recommended changes? Pat. I'm recommending on page three, uh, the bottom paragraph, I'm recommending on page three, the bottom paragraph, be it further resolved that the, instead of administrative assistant to the Amherst Town Council, it should read clerk of the council. Okay. I think that generally accepted since we don't have an administrative assistant to the Amherst Town Council. Other, other uh, recommended edits? Mandy? I have two syntactical ones. They are on page okay. three at the very top, the sort of continued on paragraph. Okay. I believe the verbs prohibits and requires need to be singular prohibit and require. So I would just get rid of the S's based on how it's worded in that whole paragraph. Prohibit political. It's a two clause, right? To ensure, yeah. Yeah, that, I think syntactically that makes sense. And probably a comma after abortion care? Where are you in the same paragraph? Right. I don't think the comma's needed because it's only two. Well, it's ensure. No, the ensure, and then it says, prohibit. and among other provisions is where another comma is, right before the prohibit. And require a valid to provide. Okay. Other comments, questions? We have Lynn Morgan here um, as to field any questions or give their input. Steve, George? No. No? Any issues in terms of actionability? None that I see. Does anyone see any, any issues with actionability? I mean, I think the only action it's asking us is to, we support and then, right. and then we're asking commit the and then send something on. Right. Yeah. I don't see how that's not actionable. Certainly. Okay. So clear, consistent, actionable. Any final comments before we have yes. a vote? I hope it, can I do yeah. I Please, hope you Pat. all vote in favor of it at the meeting. Yeah. All right. So with that I will entertain a motion to declare the resolution as amended, clear, consistent, and actionable. I so move. Second. Any further discussion? Yeah, and Pat seconded. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so call the question. All those in favor of declaring the resolution as amended, clear, consistent, and actionable? Aye. Raise your hand and say aye. All in favor? Aye. Steve? All right, unanimous. Thank you, Lynn, Thank you all. for coming. Thank you. See you later. Okay. I didn't think there was anything. 
No, it's always good to have a, a sponsor here just in case something comes up. This one was, this is also the first time that we have Looks reviewed a resolution. A resolution. The only issue I have with it is that it's quite long. <laughs> yeah. Well, but everything in it is jam packed. Yeah. All right, so in that case, uh, we will move on uh, to consideration and discussion of revisions to newly adopted rules of procedure. So this is what we've been working on for the last two meetings um, and that we're hoping to have a recommendation to the council for their July 22nd meeting. So one um, is a, dis a continuation of a discussion we had on June 5th. Um, there was a motion to add to section 2.2H that the president serves as the spokesperson of the full council. Uh, we did not at that time uh, take a vote at our last meeting. Uh, we were prepared to discuss this, but realized that the maker of the motion, I believe, was Steve, and the seconder of the motion was Pat, and since neither Pat nor Steve were present at our last meeting, we felt that it was uh, perhaps inappropriate to vote on a motion when the people who made it were not present, um, and so we tabled it until today. So this is section 2.2, which is kind of like my rule. Page six of the Word Thank document. Thank you. That's exactly what I needed. So, 2.2, uh, powers and duties of the president and vice president. There has been a recommendation uh, to add a, an H to that, that the president serves as the spokesperson of the full council. Uh, our discussion over that, I believe, from June 5th um, was whether or not the president was the only point of contact, uh, what does it mean to be the spokesperson of the full council, when is it appropriate for the president to speak, and when is it appropriate for individual counselors to speak. I believe there's still a motion, uh, an active motion to add that. Um, so I'd like to continue the discussion on that. Does anyone have any comments on whether or not to add a rule that the president serves as the spokesperson of the full council? Noting this was an edit, I believe, from a previous drafted text that had, that was a little more detailed. I don't have it in front of me. Where but do you have this? I'm, I'm looking at the six. I'm looking. So it doesn't exist in the rules of procedure yet. It'd be a recommended addition, but it's in our on our agenda. Yes, I understand. Mandy. Um, I still don't know what to do about this because I don't know if it's clear enough in what to. Way? to indicate in order for counselors to be able to follow. I know our last discussion dealt with um, who can speak as counselors. Is this one with just the wording of full counsel clear enough to indicate that, hey, if a news place calls us up because, say, Pat's sponsoring this row resolution, can she talk about it? in her own counselor capacity, or would, if we adopt this 2.2H, would that violate this? I still don't know whether this language is clear enough to say, yes, she can, um, yeah. or whether it's gonna create those provisions. Those, uh, not provisions, those sort of questions. Right, and I believe that was also at the time George's concern, that the rule doesn't necessarily provide any clear guidance. Is that correct, George? Yeah. So I guess what's our what's our goal with having such a rule, Steve? Well, I think the goal is to actually clarify this exact issue because we have gotten messages from the president stating that you know media inquiries shall be sent to you know I'm paraphrasing, but to me the impression is you shall not talk to the media. You shall refer any queries from the media to me. And I think we need to clarify if that's really what the council wants or not. So I think that offering something that should be obvious that she can speak for, you know, speaking for the town council, President Griesmeyer said blah, 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 that's totally appropriate. But then other councils can, should, and can also speak to the media. So that's how I, I think a rule is important so as opposed to no rule, mm -hmm. um, so that we have at least a response to this. So in one case, one particular case is that I did speak to the media, then we got this email, don't speak to the media, and so the 
reporter said, is there an actual rule in place that says this? And I, I, I don't think so. Right. And so the original language that was sent to us from uh, the Rules Committee in the document Rules and Recommendations for GOL um, was the President shall serve as spokesperson for all press inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council. Um, the motion that was made was simpler, again, and it was just serve as spokesperson of the full council, so it sort of removed correspondence and, and media directly called out from that. Um, so is the simplification then, we're looking for to, to provide counselors some sense of clarity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we do that? And does that simplification take away clarity or, uh, for counselors? Because um, I don't personally feel though as though uh, spokesperson for all press inquiries and correspondence necessarily offers me as a counselor any more information. George? I mean, I certainly appreciate oh, that. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, was George going to? No, 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 please go ahead, George. No, I was going to thank you. Okay, oh. Pat. I didn't check my face as a thinking face. I did, I and, did. And interpreted as, as I a speaking. Often do. That's all right. It's uh, as a thinking face. I'm um, but what I'm, I feel grateful that Lynn responds to the emails that go to all of the council. Um, out, yeah, so that's uh, positive. Um, I also feel sometimes I still respond because either I know the person or the issue concerns me a certain way. I don't say anything more than what Lynn has said, but I feel it's important that I respond. I'm concerned, just like I cannot speak for the full council, um, I don't know if the president can truly speak for the full council yep. uh, unless we've taken a vote, unless we've unless she's polled all of us. Um, I think at that point, she needs to speak as her position as a counselor. I'm, I'm not sure about all this, so I'm playing with it. Um, I'm also feel like it's okay if the media contacts her, but I think that if they contact us, we should be able to make up our mind. I don't have, I haven't had any need to respond independently to the media, but I would not like that right being taken away if there was something I really strongly disagreed with. Hang on, I'm bumbling around, but that's kind of. George, is this? I think on the other hand, we don't want a situation which is just a free for all, right. where um, anybody and everybody can talk to the media whenever and uh, they feel like um, there is a certain a sense, I think, to, uh, to the vast majority of inquiries and in, in these sorts of situations to have a single voice. So I guess we're trying to find a way to balance what seems to me a practical and reasonable uh, desire, which I think would cover most cases. I may be wrong, but against the desire of individual counselors to speak on matters of importance to them and to their district or just matters of importance to them without having to be sort of uh, cleared uh, or approved. And uh, I don't see, it, I don't have an answer to this yet, but it seems these are the two things and they both seem, I mean, we could just say, look, um, anybody and everybody can speak to the press whenever they want. And Lynn doesn't speak for the council any more than anybody else does. We could just say that. Uh, I would I would not make that motion, <laughs> but someone could. There is there's still currently a motion, an open motion on the table. We should just say no. I was just doing a hypothetical, and and it's one that I would not endorse. But that I see as an extreme view. But maybe the rest of you don't see it that way. But I see that as an extreme view, and we're trying to find a place. Um, and Evan has said that the original GOL language doesn't really help him. I wonder if we could go back to that just for a second and just listen. I just need to hear it one more time, and maybe Evan can help me understand how uh, it's not helping him. In other words, that was an attempt to be more specific, and it seemed to fail, uh, at least for Evan and maybe for everybody else. And then we went to this very gen general language, which seems to be, tell us nothing. 
Um, so if we could just, Evan, if you wouldn't mind, I don't have it in front of me, I should, right. the language, the original GOL. Right, so it, it's, I don't actually, this isn't original GOL language. This okay. is the document rules recommendations for GOL that right. I believe was compiled by the Rules of Procedure Committee there, okay. um, before they dissolved with a, a list of uh, 11 things they wanted GOL to consider. Number five on that is advise on whether to add a section to the rules that states that the president shall serve as spokesperson for all press inquiries and for correspondence addressed to the full council. And so the only thing that I see is different is between what we have and uh, in front of us in the motion and this, is that this specifically assigns the president as spokesperson for press inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council. Um, whereas ours is a bit more general, saying that the president serves as the spokesperson. Mm -hmm. The reason I don't necessarily feel like this provides more clarity to me is my assumption is when you say the president is a spokesperson, any time the council is asked something for the opinion of the council, it's the president. It sets the president as the default, whereas this sort of only really does it for press inquiries and correspondence. Off the top of my head, I don't know what other things there might be, um, but generally I, I I don't often like to call out specifics unless you I feel like there's a real need to. Um, and so I don't know if maybe if the president is at a, a meeting somewhere and is asked a question and she responds um, as president of the council, that would be not a press inquiry or how we picture of correspondence, but would be the president serving a spokesperson. And so, um, but I think that maybe to, to help direct us, there's really two questions here that I, I'm hearing float around. One of which is, does the president speak on behalf of the council? When the president speaks in response to a correspondence or press inquiry, is that on behalf of the council? Is that speaking for the council? Which is one thing that I heard a little bit um, for, certainly from Pat and Steve. Um, and then the second thing is, how do we provide guidance to counselors of essentially, when is it okay to respond and when is it not okay to respond? And I think to some extent, those are two separate but related questions. Mm -hmm. Steve? Yeah, so if we had a mayor, it would be so much simpler because <laughs> the mayor so. speaks for the mayor. So the president of the council is not exactly a mayor. So, um, and so one example, and I don't, is all the DPW press releases in which the president is quoted. So we as a council didn't approve those quotes. We didn't approve, you know, there's an implication that, you know, this is a value of the town. I happen to agree with everything, pretty much everything that was said, but it's not, there's, you know, it's, still not the, she's not speaking for the council. So it's complicated because I don't know who she's speaking for. She's speaking as the president, but she's not speaking. So speaking as the president has a lot of weight, but she's not speaking for the council. She's just speaking. Other thoughts? Some of this could be a test of the leadership and character of the person who has been chosen as president. And the council can form judgments over the course of a year. Yes. Um, so maybe um, there's only so much we can put into a rule. And uh, I think whatever, I think Evan's right, whatever we do put in a rule um, should be helpful to people looking at it, should tell them something, as opposed to some just banal generality. But we perhaps shouldn't try to, um, or maybe we just can't, um, put a rule in that covers every possible case. And there's going to be just an area where counselors will form their own judgment about how a president um, deals with these sorts of things. And if they're not happy, they can express that both to the president personally, also to the council, and eventually, if they really are unhappy, um, could uh, you know decide that they would not like this person to continue as president, assuming that they chose to do to try and do that. So maybe we try to get a rule that's clear enough that it actually does say something, <laughs> but not try to get a rule that covers every possible case because that will never get that. And um, keep in mind that part of this is judgment, and 
Um, we are, may or may not agree with the president every time she, she or he makes a judgment, but it's, a, it's something that comes with time and we, you know, an experience, so. Uh, that, that was helpful for me, George, um, in the sense that I don't think Lynn has said anything at any time that I, um, that bothered me in some way that I wanted to make a public statement about it. If, uh, I think she's done a good job of speaking about issues. Um, and I think that is part of the role of the president is to speak for the council. It just feels, uh, it just feels like a limit. And maybe, uh, but I, I agree that it could be addressed. If I really had something that I needed to say to the paper, I could certainly call in and then I'm speaking as myself as a counselor um, to the, if I then go ahead and do the paper thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I think George is right. It can be fairly, it can be fairly direct and simple. So are people okay with this, again, Evan, I guess I'm asking you this. It, it says specifically all press inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council. So, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, letter that comes or email that comes addressed to the full council, Lynn always responds to, and I appreciate that. And we, uh, at least so far, have agreed not to, um, to respond. But if something is sent to me individually, um, I would f assume that we all can respond to that individually. We don't, we don't clear that with the president. We don't, uh, uh, hopefully we use our judgment too, but that's, that's a separate matter. So uh, are people, I think that does provide me with some sense of clarity that if it's a, a correspondence um, or press inquiry that's addressed to the council, we want the president to respond. And, if we're not happy with the response, that's something we can deal with uh, at some other time, but we're okay with that. Um, but individual inquiries, if somebody, you know, like you mentioned, Evan, someone sends some, uh, a, 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 a correspondent calls up Pat and wants to talk about this uh, resolution and addresses her directly, I assume that's Pat's call, right? Yeah. Or no? Mandy? So I'm trying to figure out whether I like the you know, sort of the language that was proposed out of the rules committee or not discussed in rules, but came out of rules mm -hmm. by a, a member or the motion that's currently on the table, which is just service spokesperson of the full council. And I keep going back and forth. Um, but maybe the original sort of language that was presented to us is better because it's less broad and more specific. And the current motion is service spokesperson for the full council. That's really broad. And I think why it's not helping me, because it's so broad, but as George was talking about, for all press inquiries and for correspondence addressed to the full council, I can see situations where if a, a press a reporter calls me up, that's not addressed to the full council. But if the reporter calls up town hall and says, we want a comment from the council, town hall knows, well, that's addressed to the council, that goes to the president. Um, and so may, I, I think this wording might need, the to the full council might need clarified as to what that clause applies to, that it applies to both segments in that wording, but maybe that wording is more helpful to not just counselors, but staff and town staff of, if it's addressed, if correspondence or press inquiries are addressed to the council, we want, we're sending it to the council, who responds? But if it comes to us with a phone call to our personal number, that's not addressed to the full council. And so I could choose to or not, I could push it off and say, no, you really need to talk to the president on that one, <laughs> or I could respond myself. So maybe that more specific language is better with a little tweaking to make sure to the full council is clearly applying to both clauses. What about ceremonial 
situations where, again, we have been quite comfortable, and it, maybe that's just not an issue here, but I'm thinking of all the kinds of situations where many of us are present, but Lynn speaks for the council saying, thank you, you know, we're glad we're here, whatever. Um, that's would seem to be, that this general statement covers that kind of situation. So ceremonial public events we are comfortable with and would expect the president to speak. And at least on one or two occasions, she's then, when she's not available, she turns to the vice president. Again, seems appropriate. Does that need to be in the rules? Um, and if, it, I mean, this current statement is, that would cover that, it covers about everything. Um, but being precise and talking about press inquiry and um, uh, uh, correspondence, do we need to add something to the effect that, and you know, in general speaks for the council in public settings, or is that just assumed? Is that uh, so? So the rules cover that already on 2.2e. Just look up three lines: perform ceremonial functions. But the charter actually does say the president shall perform ceremonial functions and on the other duties. So it, that part is covered. Thank you. So I think that my only real, I'm, I'm actually wondering if maybe sort of a high revised version of the two might be best. And I think that the reason that I'm not, so president, spokes, president serves as spokesperson of the full council says that anything that's intended to represent the opinion of the council comes from the president, much like what Mandy Jo said. Mm -hmm. So if, if I go out and I say a whole bunch of things. No one, no one's going to think that's the the council speaking, right? But when Lynn says things, people will say, "Okay, well, this is coming as her as her role as a council." And I do think that's a, appropriate. I mean, I think that the town manager speaks on behalf of town staff. I think that department heads speak on behalf of their department. So I think it makes sense for her to be able to do that. What I think sort of bothers me about this language is sort of the the way I read it is the president is the person who responds to all press inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council. And I think I read it that way because that's how it's intended, right? Um, but I'm thinking about when we were getting a lot of emails for 132 Northampton Road, uh, Lynn responded to every single one that was addressed to the full council. And I'm very grateful she did because I couldn't keep up with them. Um, there were also some that were addressed to just me and those I responded to. But there were also some that were addressed to the full council, but came from constituents of mine, right? People in District 4. And I responded to those two. And I said, and my email always said, I know you've already received a response from the president, but I wanted to also respond to you as your district counselor. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a reading of this that could say, well, that was addressed to the full council. Lynn had to respond to that. That wasn't for you to respond to. What, yeah. But I feel like I, I have the, I'm not speaking on behalf of the council, but if I want to reach out, or you know, after the the date was changed, for the you know, I, I emailed every person from District Four who had emailed the full council and said, just so you know, the date has been changed on this open meeting, um, because not all of them, I'm not sure, had been emailed by the the president, and so I don't want to rush. I don't want to. So I guess maybe with something that says the president shall serve as spokesperson of the council for all press inquiries addressed. So in other words, when it's addressed to the full council and she's speaking, she's, I, I don't want to, I guess I don't want to rule that hints to counselors that they can't respond, even though I do sort of feel like that's the in, intention of this rule, right? And that's why I think that the simpler language was just clarifying, look, only the president can speak on behalf of the full council, but it didn't necessarily restrict any individual counselors ability from responding to anything because I, I do feel like there have been some counselors who have felt um, as though they were um, not not officially reprimanded but sort of it was frowned upon that they had responded right yep. um, and I don't necessarily feel like that's appropriate if, if we want to respond we should as long as it's clear that that response doesn't represent the whole council right Steve yeah, so then I always have the, and what's the implication? So let's pretend that I talk to the Gazette and I say, no, I can speak for the council that we're all totally against this. So what are the implications? He, that gets published? Do I get censured? Do I, what happens? I mean, in other words, we don't have a, 
Well, committed see, I our think, fine. I think that's a really inappropriate statement. It's totally inappropriate. Yeah. What happens if I do it? I break the rule. So. You got off. <laughs> yeah, no, but we don't have a. We'll just never speak to him I again. I mean, it's, he'll be shunned. <laughs> I, I would say if it's a rule broken, the implication is a potential censure or yeah, some sort of, yeah. I mean, there's nothing in our rules that say how do we enforce these, but Not I guess there could be a motion that says, we, we any one. other counselor yeah. could make a motion at some point that says, I move to censure Councillor yeah. Schreiber for yeah, breaking right. rule blah, 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 blah on this on date. <laughs> I, I really think that you all, you know the answer to your own question because it really is that we speak for ourselves as counselors. We don't speak for the council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about this for kind of a while. <laughs> and Mandy Jo? I was going to say, could I suggest maybe an alternate wording? Sure. Um, serve as the spokesperson of the council to all or for all inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council? Serve as spokesperson of the council. For, for all, all inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council. So we have a motion on the table. So we have a couple options. Uh, we can the motion maker could withdraw that motion and you could make that motion or we could, I, you could offer that as an amendment. And we could vote on that if people are, feel like they prefer. There seem, my, my, my sense of the group seems to be that no one except maybe me likes the language of the actual motion. So. We could, you, and I was the maker of the motion. Yeah. You were the maker, I believe. Right? We'd have to check the minutes, but I think that was the discussion Yeah, last I think that's time. right. Yeah. So I'd be happy to withdraw. Read it? The motion on the table mm -hmm. is to add section 2.2H, sir, that the president serves as spokesperson of the full council. So Steve, are you withdrawing that motion? I will withdraw. Okay, so that motion's been withdrawn. Can I do that unilaterally, or does the second group have to? I think the motion maker can just do it unilaterally. But I'm looking to Mandy Jo, because she's more experienced with this than I am. Probably just unilaterally, but it would be beneficial, I guess, if the seconder agreed. I'll look up who the seconder is. I believe it's Pat. Yeah, I agree. Uh, no, it was you, Evan. Oh. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 he only seconded it to put it on the table. Interesting. Well, so I will. I will. Don't speak for him. <laughs> I will agree to that. So, so now we have. An, uh, I'm sorry. There's, well, there's been no other. Mandy Joe put out some language, but it wasn't offered as a motion. Yeah. Um, we've been talking about this for two meetings and kind of a while today, so I, I'd love to move yes, I on. Agree. Mm -hmm. um, so does anyone want to place that language in motion? I'll, I'll do it, but, but let me. Um, so I move to add section 2.2H, quote, serve as spokesperson of the council for all inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council. Press inquiries. Just inquiries. Just inquiries. Oh, I see what you did there. All right, so there is a motion on the table. Is there any further discussion about this? It hasn't been seconded. Has Pat it? seconded it. Oh, I'm sorry. She just Thank did you. it very softly. Sorry. Sorry, George. It's okay. Um, and we've removed press because? Then it doesn't have to be from the press could be, we were talking about potentially other situations where someone calls up. It doesn't necessarily have to be a press member that says, I'm looking for a statement. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Could be a tweet from our press yeah. I, I think that also, and I, I think it was in the June 5th meeting that Steve brought this up, that the nature of press is changing and can be hard to define sometimes, right? right. So as, as someone who's tweeting 
about things and press. So I, I think I like the idea of removing press because it. Yeah. Any other discussion? Just one quick thought. Does it make sense to add something to the effect that nothing in this rule should be in other words, of that kind of language or should we just leave it, let it just, if it comes up in discussion, it'll be discussed and people will say, this does not prohibit you from, you know, responding individually, as Evan suggested. Um, is it worth putting it explicitly in this, or is it just let it let it lie? But you could put language to the fact that nothing in this rule should be uh, construed as forbidding a counselor from blah blah blah. Responding. Is that overkill? I mean, we could add counselors may respond to inquiries on their on an individual basis or something like that. Um, but I, I I think I'm tempted to leave it out for now. Um, we know this is well, this will come up and should come right. up in discussion, and that's fine. It will be answered. And I guess if it does become a a major problem, I guess we could revisit the rule. But perhaps we leave it as it is, and then deal with it in the full council. I get the sense from this body that everyone agrees there's nothing in this rule that prohibits a counselor from uh, speaking on their own behalf. Any final discussion? Okay, so the motion on the table is to add section 2.2H, the president serves as a spokesperson of the council for all inquiries and correspondence addressed to the full council. All of those in favor, raise your hands. Okay, that's unanimous. Can you break up the votes a little bit so it's a little harder for her to take notes? <laughs> So I want to actually, we have a few other things. Actually, so we have one more thing to do with rules from the recommendation. We have another thing that wasn't a recommendation or discussion follow-up of non-rules or procedure revisions. Um, which is having to do with resolutions and proclamation citations that I think George was going to follow up with Alyssa on. No. Um, the other thing we have in front of us is that July 22nd date for uh, advising the council on publication of candidate statements. Um, go ahead. Ms. We Jim. have two more things under this one, the advise on work groups. Yep, well, that's what and, and then the vote on the what we're bringing, if we're gonna if we're yeah, ready to vote, yeah. That's sort of the. But as far as like actual thing like rules to discuss, I think it's it's the work groups and that. Um, so I was in charge of drafting some language for work groups. Uh, I did not upload it to the package, uh, to the uh, packet because I felt as though it was. Uh, very much my opinion of how work groups should operate and um, that uploading it to the packet before the meeting uh, could constitute an expression of opinion to a quorum. Uh, so I will do that now. The question that I want to ask the committee is given that you haven't really had time to look at this, um, we can open this discussion, um, but I'm not super convinced, well, let's look at that and, and see how you think. So I just uploaded to the packet draft work group rules. Um, and so for some background, uh, rule, our rules of procedure that we adopted, I believe it's 10.5, I just need to, oh wait, I, th I actually, hold on guys, I had a different packet open that I uploaded it yeah, to. So, let me upload it to the correct packet. I was in our June 5th packet. And I'll delete it from the other one. Okay, it should be up there now. So the rules that we officially adopted, I believe on May 22nd in the council, uh, had we adapted 10.5 work groups, uh, but there was no language under it. Uh, and so it came to this committee to actually put together uh, the rules that would go under 
uh, that section. Uh, we began discussing this a little bit last meeting and didn't get very far and decided we needed some draft language to look at beyond what rules of procedure had put to us. So rules of procedure sa sample language was very simple, uh, which was standing or ad hoc council committees may establish work groups to consider a measure if they determine that the issue is sufficiently complex to warrant analysis of alternative approaches and or consequences of actions. Work groups shall be given a timeline for reporting back to the originating council committee. Work groups may include members of the public. Work groups are usually subject to open meeting law. The chair of the appointing authority shall provide uh, preside until the work group chair is elected. Uh, they also gave us some questions as to open meeting law, uh, who appoints. I tried to work in as much of that language as possible, um, but also expanded on it to provide hopefully some clarification. Most of this is my personal opinion of how work group rules should be. Some of it is I didn't really have an opinion and so I put something in there for the purpose of discussion. Uh, specifically that would be uh, number uh, letter D, which is who appoints the work groups. I think that there's probably some discussion to be had about who should actually appoint members of the work group. Um, so I don't know if people want to take a moment to just read through these rules, and I will not take offense to any uh, critiques. Are you in our packet? So if people, if people are done reading, I can speak a little bit to some of the decisions I made, mm -hmm. and then you feel free to ask questions. Steve? So I'm trying to operationalize this. So, right. so one example would be we need a work group to study the work group issue. <laughs> so that would be totally appropriate for the GOL to, that could be just informal. Let's have two people work on this so we don't have a quorum. Do we even need to call that a work group? Right. But then I think of the more complex things like the public art proposal, which is sort of multiple committees. So in that one, public art, it wouldn't be appropriate for the CRC to make a work group because it seems to, how do we know when? Right. I mean, right. the CRC so, is a work group for that, but how do you, yeah, how so, do we know when we, it's our call to create a work group? Right, so let me speak to this a little bit then. So in, in putting this together, I sort of tried to figure out, right, the, the what is it, the five questions? So what is a work group, right? Yeah. Who would even be on it? Why would we create one? How would we create one? And so 
the first question is what differentiates an ad hoc committee from a work group, right? And so if GOL or CRC or any committee wanted a smaller group to study things, that would just be an ad hoc committee. Um, so what differentiates a work group? And, and my thought was what makes something a work group is that it includes member, it includes people who are not members of the nice. body. So if CRC had an interesting art issue and you felt as though uh, you needed further study, but there wasn't really the expertise on CRC to fully consider that, maybe you'd make a work group that's two members of CRC, but then you would bring in two members yeah, of right. the public, or even two members of the council, but who don't serve on CRC. So that wouldn't necess that could still be considered an ad hoc committee, but to s kind of distinguish them, what differentiates it is that it brings in um, people from outside that committee. It's and not clear to me that really differentiates it from an ad hoc committee. So the question is, what? so actually, here, maybe here, maybe this is a good question also for Mandy Joe, right? Is what did rules of procedure envision when they created work groups that were separate from ad hoc committees? Um, it's hard to answer because I think I was one of the people on rules that had a problem envisioning the difference between the two. <laughs> um, but I think the thought was that work groups would be more nimble and would be able to be formed quicker without the necessary um, application procedures. If you've got members of the public for an ad hoc committee or something, I mean, obviously if it's just a council ad hoc committee, there's no real application procedure. But if you're gonna include members of the public, there's the CIF procedure and all of that. And I think the thought was that sometimes it might be desirable to not have to go through all of that and to just be able to say, hey, you expert at UMass, would you be willing to work on this group to draft this legislation? Um, or you expert here, or you expert from this group, um, and sort of go out and just recruit and form within a week, you know, very quickly, a group of people that could start um, and get it done within a shorter amount of time than if we formed an ad hoc town committee um, or an ad hoc council committee that needed, that would have um, non-counselors on it because then you have to go through a lot larger and longer of a process with an actual charge, with an actual um, waiting time, 14 days to apply and post that this is open and that this would allow more nimbleness in skipping that. And so I think the question becomes, is that wise to allow that nimbleness um, and being able to skip opening up an application to everyone in town is sort of where I sit on, is it wise? Pat? I'm thinking about the, um, this resolution that we looked at today and the one I'm working on about Medicare for all. I got approached by residents, we formed a work group to, um, work on these two resolutions. Um, and that doesn't, that sort of unnimbleness, I could have invited another counselor or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a flexibility I appreciate I, and seems important. Um, I'm left with a question of who gets to pick who the expert is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, the, the difference in my work group is that there was a group of people already working on this right. and it's aligned with my values. Um, but who gets, who gets to decide? And I think we do need flexibility. I'm just not clear how we balance or if we even do now balance voices, I, I'm not sure.
I'm beginning to wonder then, and you guys can help me, why would one ever want to create an ad hoc committee of any kind? Um, seems like work groups would be the way to go. Um, so again, I'm just trying to get clear in my own mind the difference between the two. Uh, Mandy has made clear that, that the ad hoc committee is a bit more involved. It would involve CAF, uh, public uh, application process. Um, I take it. Um, so would it be that the issue is so complex and so fraught or it just has so many different um, perspectives as opposed to a work group where we'd like to think it's more technical, it's more focused on gathering data information. It's, in other words, uh, not so much policy, but um, I'm just trying to get a sense of difference. And cause I'm, when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, well, I, I would never form an ad hoc committee. Then. I would just have work groups. And uh, that's clearly not desirable, I take it. So why, what's the difference? And, and how do people see it? Is it more um, larger issues where there are clear differences of opinion? So you want to make sure lots of different voices are heard. So it would be an ad hoc committee. Or is it? What's the difference? I'm just going to say quickly, having an ad hoc committee doesn't mean that a lot of different voices will be heard. We, you know. So, so I think the biggest difference is time. An ad hoc committee would be slower because of the multiple meetings it would take to actually form one and then get committee members appointed um, versus a work group where it could be done near immediately. Um, I don't know whether that's a good thing, though. Well, <laughs> there was a work group created over the recreation fields, right? And is there a work group for the... Um, isn't it called a work group that uh, is working on the problem of uh, the downtown recreation? They're field? called work groups, but they're really just committees, time-limited committees, ad hoc committees in a sense. Um, and so, yeah, this is where my struggle in rules was with this whole concept. But you, you have a problem, you, you see it, it's arisen, uh, you know, for instance, with the, and you want to, okay, yeah, I mean, just, right. Keep turning this off because I'm not used to this. this stays on I know, and I'm not used to it. Um, <laughs> so I think that this is the, the sort of the first question I approached with this, and I think that um, one of the things that has bothered me since we started this position is the way that we use a lot of terms interchangeably to mean different things. And so, you know, Pat and I yesterday were dealing with the question of what's the difference between an associate or an, and an alternate on a committee, right? And is there a real difference? And if there is, do we define, right? And so that was sort of my thought is, if we're gonna have rule 10.4 be ad hoc committees and rule 10.5 be work groups, there needs to be something that reasonably differentiates them. My mind, my preference, but I also recognize that we already have broken this, is that a committee that is serve, formed to serve the council shall be formed of councillors. And that the difference between a work group was it's a, is it's created by the council to serve the council, but can allow non-councillors on it, right? Can allow people who aren't part of that original committee to actually be on it. Now, of course, we have resident members of the finance committee, and so that doesn't necessarily hold. But I think that there needs to be something that when we say committee, it means something to people, and that when we say work group, it means something to people. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the difference was one, it's membership, and then two, what Mandy Joe was saying, you don't have to jump through all those hoops. And that, so that's why I, I put in there C, that they don't require a formal charge, that every, so that we don't have to, I don't want, I don't ever, ever, ever want GOL have to have to evaluate a charge for a work group, yeah. um, which is why I said, look, all this information should be in the motion. Um, the question of who appoints, you know, I threw in the, the chair of whatever body created it right. um, with the assumption that you wouldn't need a CAF process. The chair could just say, okay, these people, whether that's the best idea, I don't know, because that really depends on who the chair of a committee is. You know, maybe you wouldn't want me picking everyone who's going to be on a committee because my view of who's an expert in the committee might, in the community might be very different. Uh, and so actually, I think that 
D is probably the most contentious part of this. Um, you know, it, it lobs down to or sinks down to the idea of trust. If we're, if, if the, as a GOL, it would be easy for, hey, Mandy, Joe, and I are going to look into this issue because we're really interested in it and we're going to do that and come back and report to you. I don't think we have to do anything. That's a normal part of the committee. Right. Um, but now we're sort of saying, if Mandy, Joe, and I want to get Lynn Morgan working with us, we have to form a work group. Or do we? I mean, I don't think you would have to, right? But you. Yeah. You could. No, we don't have to have. Well, I think a subcommittee of a committee. I mean, if if two people are named, we sent Evan to draft this because right. you don't have to follow open meeting law if only one person is. Right. If we sent two of us to draft it, we'd have to post the meeting. But I think that committee can ask at any time for anyone to help talk them, to them. Right. talk with them, look over right. stuff, help them, right. um, without having them. Yeah, like if, if we were assigned to look at some resolution and we were like, we don't have a clue whether this is accurate or not, let's talk to someone. We, we could do right. that without forming a specific thing because that's our right. prerogative as a committee. I'm still not sure we need work groups. <laughs> right. I mean, I think I lean towards deleting the section completely, but so I guess one example of where it could be useful is say the percent for art thing. So let's CRC in theory could have said we need a lot more research on this. So we're going to create a work group and we're going to put in the motion the work group will have two members of CRC, two members of finance committee and two members of the public or the public art commission, right? And then That's actually something that might happen regularly in that. Right. And so it, that would make sense to have, right? But what would would that be an ad hoc committee, and if so, do you need to go through this process of getting those two public art commission members on there? And I don't, to it's me, you, you, you don't. I think if it's an ad yeah, hoc committee of the council, you don't have to go through the CAF process, right. personally. It seem, yeah, it seems like if we're, particularly if we're drawing people from committees that have already been appointed to committees, it's when you bring in something, someone that's not on a committee, and I don't know how that would work. So to take that example, if CRC wants two people from here, two people from here, and two people from public art, they could create a charge, or under this work group not, but if they created that formal charge, it would say two people from public art commission. It wouldn't need to go through CAF, and then public art could pick those. Pick right. those but if they want people. it to just be two members of the public. Yeah, then. Yeah. I still don't think that. See, this is something. I, w go ahead. I, was, I was gonna say, George, I think, had something no, to say. No, no, please Pat? go okay. ahead. George? No, I'm Karen. Because I'm on CRC, and Steve, please help me here, I feel, uh, or contradict me, whatever you want to do. Um, I can't speak for the CRC. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel s s that um, we are going to need, on a regular basis, to be collaborating with other committees because they have information on, you know, we, we're going to need to collaborate with the finance committee to f understand financial impacts, not just wait for their recommendations. If we're looking at the impact of a bylaw or something like that uh, or a proposal, then we need flexibility to meet with other committees and, and I think residents. So, and that's me speaking about it. So, Steve, if you want to add or yeah, delete. Totally agree. Yeah, I agree. George, do you have yours? Trying to get people in the community who are not members of a formal committee or counselors on a work group. What are people's thoughts on that? Um, initially, my thought was, gee, it's great, just grab somebody and, you know, because they've got this expertise or knowledge and put them to work. But what I'm also hearing or thinking to myself is that this, of course, is short circuiting certain processes that are in place 
for a reason. Nimbleness is good. Um, is it... I mean, I'm having conversations with constituents who have far more knowledge than I do about, say, an issue like health care. Um, Mandy is... You know, so if you wanted, you know, if we wanted to bring somebody like that into the conversation, um, but they're not on a committee, they're just someone who's done a lot of work or has some in a passion or interest, but there's a danger here, isn't there? That, that sort of, that arbitrarily I or a chair or somebody just picks a citizen and puts them on a, a, a public body to do work without sort of going through the usual process. And is that, does that trouble people should it trouble us? Because I understand the desire, I feel it, you know, grab this person, put them to work. You know, they, they've got a lot to offer. Um, let's not waste our time with, you know, having to go through all the process and blah, 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 blah. Um, does it make a difference if someone is invited to speak to the group, um, to the work group? Um, they're not a member of, uh, well, no, that, you can invite somebody to come and talk, sure. Yeah, but I'm so talking about putting somebody on I this know, group to, I know, to do some real work. Which is what I prefer, but... Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> but do we want to create a, a system or a process that basically allows us to circumvent certain procedures knowingly because we find it easier, makes things quicker? I mean, there's, there's attraction to that, but it's also putting us in a a dicey position where it seems like we're trying to get around certain things um, or not. So I agree 100% with what Pat said earlier that that committees need flexibility, that there might be a time when it, to some extent maybe it doesn't always make sense that this issue needs to be referred to both CRC, and, honestly, CRC and finance are probably the two that might create. I mean, I don't, I don't see too many instances where GOL or OCA will have to create work groups. Maybe they will. Uh, OCA may be around outreach, but cer certainly there might be times where committees have to work across, an issue cuts across committees, they might want to work together, they might want to bring in residents. Um, I, I agree with what Pat said about that flexibility. I guess my, my question is, I'm still having a little bit of trouble differentiating between an ad hoc committee and a work group. And the reason is what Mandy was saying about sort of process, I'm not 100% convinced that that necessarily applies to work, to, to ad, hoc, ad hoc committees, because they're committees of the council, and so they don't have to follow the traditional rules of multiple member bodies because they're of the council. And so we've had at least two ad hoc committees, neither of which had a charge, right? Um, so we haven't in the past forced charges for ad hoc council committees. We don't, ne we don't have a CAF process to appoint counselors, but if it's a council committee, I don't see why we would need a CAF process to appoint residents. There's a part of me that's wondering if we scrap 10.5 and just edit 10.4 ad hoc council committees to make it a little bit more clear or flexible or expansive because if we're having trouble if, if the main difference if we're saying oh yeah you could have residents on an ad hoc council committee and if we're saying well you don't really need a CAF or you don't really need a charge for an ad hoc council committee then I don't see the difference between the two and if there really isn't a good functional difference maybe the answer is actually editing 10.4 to reflect better what we want than creating a whole new category George? This is pretty pathetic, but um, <laughs> why not? Um, it's just work group sounds so like, <laughs> I like it. we're going to get something done. And it's focused, and it's on X, and it's, it's right there in, in the statement, and that's all they're going to do. And they can't go off and do anything else, and they have a time uh, certain, et cetera. Um, this is pathetic, I know, but it's just ad hoc committee sounds so <laughs> nothing's ever going to happen. Because <laughs> it's an ad hoc committee, and it'll just. But I know it's stupid. But um, keeping it just because I like the name is, is a sad commentary. But um, 
I guess if I try to make a distinction, it is again back to the idea that it's extreme, it's specific to a particular issue or problem. It's clearly defined in the, in the, the uh, statement or resolution that created it. Whereas an ad hoc committee, you know, has more free, free, freedom leeway. It can go, you know, the ones we've created have a certain amount of uh, flex, you know, they can go off and do other things within some limits, right? But a work group, if you can't, if you're doing recreation fields, that's what you're doing. If you're doing healthcare costs, that's what you're doing. Um, yeah, and, uh, but maybe that's just, the difference in the end it doesn't make it. But I'd like to save them, but it's, <laughs> I hear Evan's point. Mandy? So if we take Evan's suggestion, I'm, I'm reading 10.4 now, which is very basic. Um, yep. I think the only thing that we might need to change is the last sentence of the main paragraph, which is council charges to establish ad hoc committees shall specify the purpose and membership. We could change that to council motions because a motion is to adopt a charge or a motion could be to create. If we change it to motions, that might give the flexibility needed um, for it, it would prohibit committees of the council from creating ad hoc council committees, but that doesn't prohibit them from creating subcommittees as CRC, no, as OCA has already done. The subcommittee has to include members of the committee though, that's generally the thought of what a subcommittee is, but um, if we wanted to allow ad hoc committees created by council committees, we could probably change this one to say the council or council committee may establish ad hoc committees, but I'm not sure we want to give that authority to a committee. <laughs> well, I'm thinking that then a committee could essentially do an end run around the whole council on something right. that might not I, I don't know. I mean, uh, all of it, is, as Pat says, goes back to trust, too. Yeah. I think we should just make work groups and not say anything about them. <laughs> <laughs> Steve? Well, I think one example that Pat gave was that nothing prevents, like any counselor but working by him or herself can work with other people on anything they feel like. And come, and then that counselor can be the sponsor of a measure. I mean, that we've already that that already happens. Mm -hmm. So I think what happens is when you get more than one counselor, that it becomes, or where it becomes, seems to be a subset of a committee or of the council itself. But nothing in this this act prevents any citizen work group that includes a counselor, actually multiple counselors. I know, as long as there's not a quorum. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. It's just formalizing what I bet is a, a common practice already for most councils or probably when you're doing different work on different issues, you're meeting with people. Maybe, I mean, it, I don't know. It might become a common practice when we get time. <laughs> that's, that's, true. that's true. I had to stop a whole set of my kitchen cabinet reading that one at times. You know. <laughs> I mean, so I think that the the difference between you know Pat's example and what this envisions is this is to address a need that's identified by the council or a committee, and so if the committee says we need people to examine this and it's more than one counselor then you know it is it is a subcommittee um, the question is I mean you could have a subcommittee that heavily consults with residents right mm -hmm. but do you actually want them I guess the big difference is do you ha do they have a vote right and you know in theory any committee could create a subcommittee and the council could create an ad hoc committee and they could be encouraged in the motion to create, to bring in residents, right? I mean, you could even specify the number of residents. Those residents just don't have a vote. To some extent, 
I would, I would perhaps argue that a resident shouldn't have a vote on a council committee, right? I mean, that's why finance committee members are non-voting. Uh, I, I was just, I was going to say, I'm going to say this. I know Pat's going to disagree with it, um, because they're there, they're there for consultation. They're there for their opinion, for their expertise. Um, but at the end of the day, if it's a committee to serve the council, the vote should should be the councilors. So I guess. There's a lot of what is this trying to accomplish, and I, I keep hearing a lot of things that I'm not convinced can't be accomplished within the current structure mm -hmm. that we have yeah. in the rules, yeah. other than the name. Maybe we can call them ad hoc work committees. Mediators. Sub work hoc committees. Collaborators. <laughs> Collaborators. Mandy? So can I make a motion? Sure. Please do. I'm going to move to delete section 10.5 in its entirety and renumber the remaining sections appropriately. There's been a motion made. Is there a second? Uh, are we ready for discussion yet? Or we we have a second. It it has a second from somewhat Pat. seconded. So <laughs> we're open for discussion. So we were sent off to develop a way to enable work groups. Yep. <laughs> and our solution has been to eliminate. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, that in is. In a way that does enable it. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, in a way it does enable it because it takes away all the restrictions. <laughs> I don't feel, my, personally speaking, I don't feel ready to make such a drastic decision, um, though in the end I might be won over, um, maybe even today, but I think given the complexities of this, maybe I'm making it more complex than it is, but um, I don't feel personally ready to, to just eliminate this. Um, I'm still struggling with what we believe already exists with a little modification that will do exactly what this was supposed to do. And the answer may be it, it is, we do have it, it's there. And I just would need that to be in my own mind a little bit clearer. And once it were clearer, then I could say yes, okay, let's eliminate this. But at the moment, maybe it's just the, me, but I can't, I'm not clear enough yet to, to support this motion. Um, Mandy? So if I'll, I'll speak to it. Um, I've always had trouble differentiating between the two as, as many counselors here, or at least, a, at least one other counselor here has, has recognized that I'm still not sure between the difference between ad hoc committee and work group. My biggest concern with work groups as we look at them is the avoidance of the CAF process um, mm -hmm. and the ability to just one person to just say, you're on it. Um, if we've got a policy matter that is so complicated, um, I think the current draft of work group before I moved to eliminate it was sufficiently complex to warrant in-depth research beyond the capabilities of the originating body. Um, I don't feel comfortable having one person, not, not having one person, that, that I'm comfortable with in a, in a sense. I don't feel comfortable with avoiding the traditional ways and means of garnering interest and gathering interest in serving on that work group committee, whatever you want to call it, that is sufficiently complex. I think it should be something that is put out to every resident in town for an interest and advertised for a certain amount of time. And I do think this everything we've talked about, about what a work group would be for, creating flexibility, creating ability to do it quicker, circumvents all of that. And I'm not comfortable with circumventing a process that would 
lean heavily potentially on those we already know about instead of those that we might not know about that could be interested. So I'm feeling very torn. Um, on the one hand, as I said, I don't necessarily, I agree with a lot of what Mandy Jo said, and I, I also think a lot of what the intentions were behind work groups could probably be accomplished, especially if we revise the language a little bit of 10.4. Um, I'm also feeling a little bit of what George said, which is the council voted, uh, I think unanimously for these rules with the assumption that work groups would be in there and we would draft the rules for them. And now to come back, on the other hand, we could say, look, we discussed this and we, th you know, this is our consideration. One of my other areas of, of slight discomfort um, is that I, uh, unfortunately did not read all of the minutes from the Rules of Procedure Committee, and so don't necessarily know too much about the debate that went into this recommendation. Uh, we have one of the five members of Rules of Procedure here, which is a great insight, but it was also one of the five members who was uh, opposed to the inclusion of this. And there is a part of me that would like to hear perhaps from the members of Rules of Procedure who championed to get this in the rules and, and, and so I, there's a part of me that's also, that's sort of wondering if perhaps, um, I, don't, I don't know if I agree with what I'm about to say, but in the same way that we often invite sponsors in, if it would make sense to invite a member of Rules of Procedure who thought this was really important to say, here are our concerns, why, why did you want this in here? And, you know, and maybe they'll say, yeah, you know what, you're right, and maybe they'll have a good reason that we haven't heard. Um, so there's a part of me that agrees with George, and I'm not quite sure I'm ready to vote on this. Yeah, I would vote no on it. I think we should have somebody from the other side come in. Is it possible? Uh, uh, Mandy? Um, so can I provide a solution where we might still be able to get these rules to the council by? I would love that. Next, by the 22nd. Mm. Um, leave, I'll, I can withdraw my motion. Um, leave work groups as it is, which is just highlighted, will be in later, propose everything else we've done to the council, report out that we're still working on work groups. The person who most advocated for this was Kathy Schoen. Shane? Shane. Shane. <laughs> um, so I would recommend inviting her to she, one of the next meetings. Come, I'm, sure. Um, I'm sure she would be delighted to come and speak to it all. Um, and I think you could, we could inform the council that we formed a work group to <laughs> examine whether we should keep work groups. So I think that that's what I'll, I think that we should, so the motion's been withdrawn, so we don't need a table. I will formally withdraw. Draw. Okay. And so I will talk to Kathy and see if she is available to come to our July 24th meeting um, to have a discussion with her about work groups. Um, but I would say now that I probably wouldn't intend to vote on anything on work groups for that 24th meeting, um, especially since we have another meeting before the council meets again after the 22nd. So the 24th, I think, will, would just be discussion. So with that, then, we have gone through all of, I believe, and Mandy Jo, please correct me if I'm wrong, the recommendations from Rules Committee. Um, Mandy, is the with the exception of the one that we adopted today on the president as the spokesperson, does the rules of procedure that's in our packet represent everything that we've done to date? Yes, the only addition would be the, the one that is titled with three changes. So I think there were, I, no, I think only one is uploaded, right? There's only There's one, one on uploaded. That is the one that represents work to date and updated um, table of contents, um, except for one thing which I'd like to bring up, and then it does not have 2.2H that we just added in today. Right. And I have, I have a new document that does have that in with a comment that says by unanimous vote on July 10th. I just wanna bring up Appendix C. Okay. That we've never dealt with. It is in there, I don't think it's ever referenced in the rules itself, and it is supposed to be the OCA appointment and appointment confirmation process. And that will have to remain. I was well, wondering whether we just want to vote to delete the appendix completely. Appendix C appendix completely. C. 
Appendix C. Do we delete Appendix B? We did delete Appendix B, so we would what have to rename. B? Appendix B remember. was supposed to be the town council committee charges, and we, and we moved to just yep. hyperlink directly to the right pages on the website. Um, so Appendix C would need renamed to B. It would need to be put back into the table of contents. Um, but I kind of want to just get rid of it. So I will speak for myself and not as chair of OCA. Um, obviously, we have a current appointment process. It will not be the appointment process uh, in the future. Future generations of OCA may also uh, revise that process. Uh, Appendix C seems like something that could potentially be having to be continuously revised, um, especially because um, as we've learned on OCA, this process is not always universally applicable. Um, so obviously the process had to be slightly different between planning board and zoning board and say rank choice voting because there was joint appointing authority and even slightly revised for finance committee since um, a, a lot of the structures didn't exist for it that it did. So this would be a really hard one I think to put in. And so I would support removing Appendix C. Other thoughts? My other colleague on OCA? Uh, agree. Remove it. Appendectomy. <laughs> other? Th Remove it. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> other thoughts? So Mandy, I don't, I don't think you made that as an official motion. Would I'll, you like to? I'll make a motion to Delete Appendix C from the Rules of Procedure. And a second. Any further, any further discussion? Okay, all of those in favor of removing Appendix C from the Rules of Procedure? Yes, all right, that's unanimous. George, you seconded that, right? Yes, I did. Okay, so with the removal of Appendix C and with the addition of 2.2H, the president's spokesperson, one that we did today, um, we have a revised rules of procedure that responds to everything we were asked to do by rules of procedure with the exception of work groups, which we'll have to say we're still working on. Um, I think there was a request that we have this to the council for a vote on the 22nd. Yes. First reading. First needs, reading, first read, right, because we have vote. that in our rule. So we want a first reading to the council on the 22nd. Do we feel as though we are ready to make a recommendation that the council adopt the revised rules of procedure? Pat, that's a motion? Yes. All right, so Pat is making a motion. <laughs> what, what is that motion, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> to recommend to the town council the acceptance of the revised uh, rules and procedure. Is there a second? A second. Discussion? <laughs> does does the motion need to include the dates we did the revisions or just right now I have motion to recommend to the town council the acceptance of the revised rules of procedure is is that is that good enough we probably should have We, I don't think we need all of the dates, right? There's no so single date. Perhaps. Oh, yeah, then. Okay. As, okay. Just keep it like it that. It could just be recommend the town council adopt the rules of procedure as revised by GOL. Oh. And we just hand it. Town Here's council. our revised version. It's in the packet. That whatever. Does that work? So right now I have motion to recommend 
to the town council, recommend the town council adopt the rules of procedure as revised by GOL? That would be, I guess that would be a friendly Would that be friendly? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Okay, any discussion on that? All right, all of those in favor? Aye. All right. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that probably caught that, didn't it? <laughs> um, oops. It's nice to see somebody else having trouble with their mic. I'm not used to it always being on. Okay, so um, we will present this to the council along with a report that details um, what we revised with specifics. Um, I will write that report, I assume, since you will be I forwarded you, you did. part of it already. You did, yes. I was gonna say, but hopefully you sent it, but now <laughs> you, I remember I just saw You've that. got most of it yes. done in terms of as it relates to the rules. And that I appreciate. Okay, so um, we have a, a couple other things on our agenda, but we're starting to, we only have a half an hour left. And so I wanna actually take um, what is listed on the agenda in your packet uh, I, I know we have to talk about resolutions, proclamations, citations, however, I don't feel like that's as time sensitive. Um, but number four, discussion on referral from town council to advise on a policy to comply with charter section 7.6. I believe part of the motion from the town council was to report back by the 22nd. And so uh, I, we should do this one now because we need uh, to have something to report back to the council uh, for the 22nd. So since this has a time constraint on it, um, let's do that. So, 7.6 of the charter, right? So, 7.6 of the uh, charter, 7.6 of the charter, publication of candidate statements. The town council shall establish a process compliant with state campaign and political finance laws for candidates whose names will appear on the election ballot to publish statements regarding their candidacy on the town bulletin board. So, since we develop policies, uh, for the council, as we did with public ways. Uh, this has been referred to us to develop. So lucky us. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts? There was, Mandy. So I'm, I'm never one without thoughts. Um, I, I know. No, um, I, I certainly have, based on my service on the Charter Commission, thoughts on what the Charter Commission, in a sense, um, looked at or thought about this, how this might look. Um, I think we need as a committee to decide whether we want a opinion from the town attorney first on what might be possible or whether, and then we discuss once we get that, or whether we want to discuss what we want first and say, and then ask the town attorney, would this be possible if we suggested this with certain caveat, you know, like all the warnings on the website or whatever that you might do. I, I think we need to decide which order we want to do those in. Do we want to discuss a potential idea first of what we want to recommend and then go to the town attorney or do we want to go to the town attorney first? How can we go to the town attorney if we don't have a clear sense of what it is we yeah. want them to, uh, so I think we really do have to get some idea of what it is that we want before we can go to the town attorney and say, okay, this is what we want, is it, is it legit? Um, seems to me, I don't, what could, we, what could we bring to the town attorney right now uh, before having any conversation at all that would be uh, useful for the town attorney to do or that would come back to us that would be useful? And maybe the answer is there is something, but Andy, what would, would it be that we could ask them to do or seek out for us? Uh, is it just the basic idea of putting a candidate statement on a, a town website and just ask them whether that's, will that fly? Is that, I mean, we could do that, I guess, right? So I'm, I'm also maybe, so I think part of this comes from our council discussion where uh, uh, Councilor Brewer, I think, felt that this would be very difficult to do yeah. and that we shouldn't even bother utilizing our time on this until we know if it's even possible. Um, I, I do sort of agree with you though, it's, would we just say, is this possible? And they might go, well, it, it's, it's, I hate o leaving open-ended questions for the town attorney. Um, my question for Mandy Jo on top of sort of what George said was also, I mean, the town attorney looked at the charter 
Exactly. That was my question. Okay. Right? I know that you got feedback from the town attorney. Did they have comments on this? Um, maybe. Um, I don't have that on this computer, or else I'd be able to actually look it up. I can look it up after this meeting. Um, I know personally both the attorney generals and our town attorney looked at this, at the charter, the preliminary charter. The town attorney looked at both the preliminary that we sent off to the attorney general and then the final one that was voted on. The attorney general only looked at the preliminary one. This provision was in the draft charter that the attorney general looked at. Um, I know personally I was surprised that this was not dinged by the attorney general as non-allowable. Um, but it could be because of the wording. I mean, the wording from the council, from the charter is the town council shall establish a process compliant with state campaign and political finance laws for candidates, blah, blah, blah. So as long as we said it needs to comply, so I don't think the turn, town attorney, at that point, the town attorney or the attorney general doesn't really have anything to object to because we're saying it has to comply with the laws if it's done. Um, I, yeah, so the question is, is there something that can? The Attorney General might have read that and said, they'll never find something, but they can put it in the charter because this doesn't yeah. violate the law. We don't know because they didn't comment on this. Um, you know, I, so I don't know, as, as Councillor Brewer said, I don't know whether there is something that would comply because you're using a state resource for election candidate statement purposes. So I don't know whether we could find something that would comply. It might be good, as George said, to send something off that says, could we make sure the town website lists the names that will appear on the ballot before the draft ballot is up? Like, yeah. could we require that? And could we allow a hyperlink to something? You know, and you know, like, our, here's some options. Like, maybe we send some options off that says list of names names with hyperlinks to candidate web pages or Facebook pages, a statement no more than whatever that the candidate drafts with a website that says this is not town opinion. You know, like, could we send something like that off that says here's some potentials, what, if any, could be done? But I can certainly look to see if our town attorney made any comments to either of our drafts on this issue completely but I don't have that on this computer, so I can't access it right now. Chief? Yeah, so we know that statements are made on town websites that are opinions, so they're not, <laughs> like they're not all fact-based. So there are websites that the town sponsors that are you know, very opinionated. I have no idea how elections, you know, fit into that, but definitely there is a point of view on, you know, things that get posted. So there's all kinds of information already available about candidates. So campaign finance, right? So we already know um, through the finance statements how much are, is being donated. So I'd be very curious as to whether or not, you know, uh, what the legality of this is, but I think Simply asking the question is, now that we have to focus on this, is it legal to, you know, to put a statement on? Is a is a totally fair question for the town attorney? Right. Other thoughts? George. So it sounds like an initial inquiry might be in order. Is that what I'm hearing here? That yeah. uh, and Steve is suggesting it. Um, just sort of test the waters before we spend any of our precious time on this issue. If we can just agree on what that simple question would be, maybe the way Steve phrased it has pretty much captured it, but do people feel like that's where we're headed? Before we spend our time on this, let's get at least some general legal opinion. I mean, I think I favor that, unless we can very quickly determine what we'd want it to look like, but I'm not sure we can. So a, a question of, can, is it legal to, for the town 
website to host statements of candidates that will appear on a municipal ballot? I don't know if that's the appropriate question. That tracks well, that, that, sort of the wording, and if so, what parameters must they follow? You know, like if she determines it's, if the town attorney determines it is legal, can she advise us on potential parameters? Or maybe that's putting the cart before the horse. Maybe the first question we need is, is it legal? Can it be done at all? And then we need to propose what we want to do, and then she can say, that works, that works or that's not going to. I don't know, the, the, Evan, you're on OCA, so you guys talked a lot with the town attorney about legality on other things, or is this something that it would be better to have, to put that question out there and then have a conversation with her during a meeting on, how did that work with OCA back and forths versus conversations and all? So OCA sent the town attorney um, three fairly well-developed processes and asked for the opinion on those. Um, basically got back, this one will not work. Um, this one will work. And then f from there, later had a conversation with the town attorney on some of the logistical tweaks to make sure it works. Um, but we started with something that was fairly developed. Um, having gone through that process, I like the idea of getting a little bit of information ahead of time because we probably could have saved ourselves some, some time had we thought of those questions ahead of time. Um, I, I, I agree with the idea of, of getting a little bit of information ahead of time. I don't want us to spend hours developing a process only to have it shut down. Trust me, it's not fun. Um, I'm just trying to envision what the question is. Because you're right, you wouldn't just say, you wouldn't just say setting section 7.6 and say, hey, can we do this? Because it's like, well, if it complies with state campaign and political finance, yeah. And then you go back and you say, okay, well, how do we do that? But it's not on the attorney to come up with a process that works, that's, that's on us. So I guess the question is what Mandy Joe said of can a town publish statements but then there needs to be something else, because if, if she comes back and says, yeah, in theory, cool. So that, yeah. I just, I'm not quite clear on what the actual, I, I don't know if you're writing this email to town attorney or if I'm writing this email to town attorney. I, I, well, I, I think it has to go through Lynn and Paul. Um, I'd have to look at the formal referral, because I think yeah. the referral sort of included. I, it certainly has to go through Lynn and Paul in a way they need to know. Right, um, certainly, but they're not going to write the no, questions. No, the two of us could work together the right. next few days to do it. Um, so I, 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 if, if I'm involved in this, I'd love a little bit of guidance from the committee of what specifically we're asking the town attorney that would be useful for us. Is the key here the idea of a statement? In other words, it's an expression of opinion by someone who's running for office. Is that the, the kernel? Or, because uh, we also mentioned web links and just names. Um, is the, the core issue here that you'd like some clarification on before we get started? Just the legality of statements of opinion? Um, is that really what you're after here? Would that help focus this with the lawyer, or is it something else? Um, so I think the else is any added bonuses. When you read the charter, the charter says, um, you know, compliant for candidates whose names will appear on the election ballot to publish statements regarding their candidacy on the town bulletin exactly, board. Exactly, right. So, you know, hyperlinks and all of that would be a bonus. Um, the, really the issue is a statement, you know, right. But, but right. the charter, compliance with the charter is to find a way compliant that allows candidates to publish statements. Um, and that would be regarding their candidacy, yeah. So that's what we need some clarification on. Well, we don't have primaries anymore. 
so just generals. But um, but yeah, municipal candidates. So maybe the question is. Is a town bulletin board permitted to be used to allow candidates to publish statements regarding their candidacy? And I don't know if that's the greatest wording. We could expound on that by what that might mean on a website or town bulletin board can mean many things you know could that mean the candidate comes up with a statement and it gets they tack post tack it to the bulletin board next to the town clerk's office like we could potentially maybe give a few examples i but yet we haven't discussed any of them so including whether this is a good idea at all <laughs> the charter tells us <laughs> that's the that <laughs> so that's who rules and the, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating uh, reading the, trying to actually operationalize the charter because yeah. you can, I can't imagine all the discussion that, okay, we'll agree to this if you agree to that. Right. But the, so we'll be the first of the 351 cities and towns to do this, we think. Yeah, okay. That's fine. I mean, I don't see any negative drawback and forget of laws and all that right now. <laughs> yeah, silly yeah. laws. I, I usually ignore them. Um, it's not true. Um, but I, I don't see any negative drawback for having candidates' statements on the town website. It, it doesn't bother me. I mean, it's, and it sort of helps candidates who don't have a lot of money to have, right. you know. I, so, I'm not sure, so I would like to just get an opinion about it. Yeah, I but so it, it sounds like we, we really do agree that we'd like an opinion from a lawyer on whether statements by a candidate on a town website has any legal possibility. Is that fair? So it sounds like it, the question is, can the town publish statements regarding candidacy written by the candidate, you know, on the town bulletin board, with of course the understanding that when we say town bulletin board, we mean the website, right? right? Yeah. I mean, that's our town bulletin board. Um, because that might be different, you know, maybe they, it can just go on a physical bulletin board, but these are gonna go on the website. So I think we need to be clear about that. And then I guess, the, do we leave it simple? Sometimes with the town attorney, it's good to just leave it as a very simple one question and follow up later. Because then if the answer is yes, then we need to go back to the town attorney, right, and say, so what, or do we say that in the first email, if, if yes, if no, it's, if no, the town absolutely cannot do this, then we have a whole other discussion. But if it's yes, the question is, so what, is there content that cannot be in that statement? Because maybe they can say, hi, my name is Evan, and I live at 40 Spalding Street, but I can't say, hi, my name is Evan, I live at 40 Spalding Street, and I think that we should eliminate the Department of Public Works, right? I don't, um, but you know, like maybe maybe that latter thing, issues that you cannot put that on the town website, right? Because the town can't use resources to argue against the town. I don't, you right? Like there's yeah, there's maybe a weird thing. Have mercy on your soul. Argument. <laughs> 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 well, there's, yeah, so then you get into the culture. Oh, right. I, I, there is the larger issue that Pat has raised that I would love to have a discussion on, but we could talk about it for a long time. We don't want to do it now whether this actually is a good idea at all. I have my personal views on it, Pat has hers, <laughs> and I might change my view, but um, again, it sounds like we would like at least an initial opinion. Um, is that, or would you rather have this discussion before we waste, waste I'm not sure that's quite word, that word I'm gonna use, but uh, employ our attorney doing, looking into this. I mean, I think an initial yes or no would be helpful because it might come back, <laughs> campaign finance laws do not allow the town website to be used for any election purposes and a statement created by the candidate is an election purpose, so no. You know, like, that might be the answer that it just can't be done. It would be refreshing to get a simple yes or no from a lawyer. But, um, <laughs> maybe uh, that would happen. <laughs> I think if the answer is yes, maybe the question we want to follow up with is, are there limitations to what, what can be done? Yeah. You know, 
what limitations could we put on the statements? Could, you know, could we put a content limitation? Probably not. But can we put a, a length limitation? Potentially. Um, can we give a list of words we can do? <laughs> you know, it, is it, are we allowed to say it can't be more than two sentences? Motivation. You know, like, are there any limits we could put on it um, if we allow it? But I don't know whether that's getting the cart before the horse versus let's get a yes and then maybe if, if, the, if the answer yeah. is yes, we come back, we discuss, and then we send something specific like Oka did. So and then that was my question. Is the first email like a one simple question, yes or no, or is it a if yes, here's other questions? I think that would be wise. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> I give you two. A or B? B. B. You know, the, the general question, and if it is legal, then whatever. Okay. Other well, considering this is, is, if I've heard correctly, this has never been done in the Commonwealth. Um, I have a feeling the lawyer probably won't have any uh, thing to go on beyond yes or no. I, in other words, well, then what can you do? The answer is nobody's done it, so, so you know, nobody knows. Yeah. Um, I think that the basic question is, can this even be done? And that may turn out to be a, a complex and thorny issue, but maybe it would be simple. I'm hoping it's simple, and I hope the answer is, well, I won't say it. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Mandy, Joe, and I are going to write an email that will go through Lynn and Paul to the town attorney to ask for an opinion on this. Uh, we should put a request back by, uh, do we want to, when's our next meeting, the 23rd? 24th. 24th. We want it back by our meeting on the 24th or this, our August 7th. We could ask for it by the 24th. I'm in no rush, but. <laughs> so papers well, 2022 there is, there is candidates. <laughs> For the current election cycle are due in September. Um, I had that date somewhere. Yeah, um, there is that time. Crunch. I there think is it's a bit of a time crunch. Due the September seventeenth. Um, so if if there's something that is allowed, we should probably get a recommendation to the council by the seventeenth, so that the council could adopt prior to then, so that when papers are due and certified, the town's got an idea of what might be going on. Um, but that gives us, what's our first August meeting? The 7th. Maybe by the 7th? That would give us two meetings to discuss yeah. before we send it to the council on the 9th of September. Yeah, so we have, we have four meetings before September 17th, GOL. So, so if we send a policy to the council on the 9th, it might have to go through that immediate a vote that day? I don't know. What's the council calendar? What's the other meeting in September? Um, the 23rd's the other one. Which adoption then, three days after, a week after papers are due, might not be horrible. No. Election's well, not till November. Right. I mean, so that's sort of my thing is it doesn't, even if we adapt it on the 23rd, it's not gonna go up on the 23rd because they still need time to, they might have to create a web page, right? But also, I don't think it needs to go up the moment that we have a full list of candidates. It, yeah, it's going right, back. could go up, yeah. could go up in mid-October, honestly. Like, so, so we'll say um, the, we're requesting back for the 7th. August 5th then? We might as well make it two yeah, days we probably should be able to read it before. Although that hasn't always How been the case. How responsive is the town attorney to deadlines? <laughs> the, ca the camera's on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like trying to find a doctor and they're on vacation. But All right, so uh, we're starting to get a little short on time. Uh, and so I want to just make sure we take care of minutes since we do have three sets of minutes, uh, May 22nd, June 5th, and June 19th.
second. And eight feet. So we have two. We have, but we have two sets from June fifth. There's draft one and draft two, right? Draft yeah. two is the most current. That that makes sense. And then the, on May twenty second, there are one. There's a draft with my revisions that has been usurped by. The May twenty second, twenty nineteen one. Is that the one that has the highlights? This morning. Uh, the one that's titled "Minutes May twenty second, twenty nineteen is the current one. The correct one that we're looking yeah. at. Okay. Do we have any edits to these three sets of minutes? I would second that motion. Any any edits? Mandy? Yeah. All right. So motion to cool. adopt the minutes of May 22nd, 2019, June 5th, and June 19th uh, has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Raise your hands. All right, and that's unanimous. So, we don't have any public present, so we don't need to do public comment. Um, we don't really have time to get, so uh, we have two things on the agenda that we haven't yet done. Uh, one is create and recommend a policy for resolutions, proclamations, and citations. Um, we don't, I don't think that we can do that in seven minutes, no. but I, I, <laughs> I, I am curious, George, if you had an ability to. I am ready and ready to roll here, but that's okay. Uh, we can put this off. I did have a conversation with uh, Alyssa and it was quite fruitful. And I have spent just a few moments uh, of my time, uh, precious time, um, trying to come up with definition of these terms, mm -hmm. which I'll be happy to, happy to share with you at a future meeting. Um, but uh, I think it probably should be put off. Also, flags came up. Flags. And flags. Um, I would like to <clears throat> also speak about, briefly about that and what I learned from Alyssa about that. And uh, so it's proclamations, resolutions, commemorations, and citations and flags, and flags. But for a future, maybe next meeting. Okay, um, is there anything, I'm just trying to think if you have, you have papers in front of you. Um, it, do you just have notes or did you actually have draft uh, information? I just have um, notes from my conversation okay. and I have um, short definitions that we could use to, I mean, if people want to spend the time, but I think it probably would be helpful. One of the suggestions Alyssa made was try to make, just get clear on what these all, you know, what are the differences? And right. I think they're pretty clear, but just we should talk about it. And I could certainly furnish that next time as simply a document for us to look at. Or I could send it to you, it's very simple, it's like four sentences, but. It's uh, already done? Uh, just from, I, I haven't, I could easily do it and uh, what, put, load it on, put it on, the, uh, on our site for people to look at before the next meeting? What's, uh, what would you prefer? Or it's just, it, these are sample definitions. These yeah. things to look at 
um, for these four terms, resolution, proclamation, citation, and commemoration. Amanda, you had something to say? Any thoughts? I was just going to say that if you distribute it today or say that it will be distributed, that meet, that complies with open that, meeting and law that so that question. then you can, then it can be uploaded to Then I can be, so I, I, I can so. say that I will um, share it with you. Yeah. yeah. That, and, okay. um, and then we can talk about it when we meet next. Um, my notes are really just my notes. Um, okay. um, I don't feel like I want to or should share them. That's fine. So if you so um, before our next meeting, I'll I'll create a packet for next meeting. Okay. Uh, I can do that today, and um, when you can upload those definitions, so that um, we can read them ahead of time and have a, a starting off point, um, and hopefully, uh, barring anything major happening, open with that at our July twenty fourth meeting. Now, would you, you have been very good about sort of thinking about these as you did today and sort of guiding the discussion. Do you want me to do something similar or do you want to just, we could just throw it open, but um, sort of have a, sort of a, a, a template in mind or a process in mind as, as we work through it? Do you want me to take the lead on this or do you want to just, we have the definitions, let's just talk about it. It's, it's hard for me to give an answer on that without knowing more about your conversation with Alyssa. So maybe since, since we don't have any real um, time pressure on this, we have, we have like really three meetings before the council takes up any substantive business. Um, perhaps we can just start with a discussion and then uh, in the same way that I took some of the opinions I got on work groups from our initial discussion, right? I didn't create that from scratch. That's from what I heard from you and Mandy Jo. Um, and then the other thing we had on our agenda was uh, continue follow-up on town committee charge request. Uh, we have uh, a table, a spreadsheet from George that has been uploaded. Uh, so <coughs> our beginnings. Go ahead, and people should just look it over and see what's missing or if they'd like something added. It's, it's really just a list. Okay. Um, and if they would like more detailed information or if they're, particularly if we're missing something um, from that list, um, but just to guide us. Okay, so uh, George will be the star of next meeting. We'll open up with proclamations and then we'll also have a follow-up on town committee charge. Uh, any final comments before we adjourn? Mandy Jo? I, I, I won't be at the next meeting, but if flags are taken up, just put them as a separate agenda item because that's a revisiting of the public ways policy. Right. So yeah. it okay. should be listed as a re revisit public ways policy regarding flags and commemorative flags. And I just want to mention two things, just if it's okay, of potential future agenda items or people things to think about. Um, one is the issue of town websites in general and expressions of opinion. This is something that uh, um, Lynn mentioned to me as well. Um, the particular example has to do with uh, 132 Northampton Road, but whether there is or needs to be a policy about what is permitted or what isn't permitted. Um, one of our members today mentioned that there is a fair number, a fair amount of opinionating on town websites. and. Um, I think that's something, I don't know if this would be appropriate for this body, but somewhere I think we should, we should talk about it um, and whether we need to have a policy on this or whether it's just, I would think, generally speaking, that it should not be a place for opinion. But anyway, that's one thing I'd like us to, to consider thinking about. And the other is just a, what I call electoral reform. Is that something that this body should uh, take up as, I've just issued, generally speaking, of, you know, oh, whole host of things. One of them has already been come up with finance reform, uh, student engagement, uh, non-resident voting. Um, there are a whole host of issues related to this. I wonder if that relates to governance or, yeah, it's, yeah, something to think about. Think this about. is councilor comment, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it may be something that nobody w wants to talk about, but uh, that's yeah. fine. Just, I'd like yeah. to talk about that. Yeah. At some point, some future date. Right. Um, there's a host of issues related to what I consider electoral or elections, electoral mm -hmm. reform, um, that may or may not be appropriate for this body to uh, look into. Right. All right. So with that, uh, we will adjourn the meeting at 12.29 p.m. Nice job. Thank you, Evan. Thank you. Yes.